Okay, welcome to the Rick Fuller podcast presented by Rick Fuller, the team leader of the number one team in the San Francisco Bay Area and Sac County for most recent sales according to Zillow. Rick is a national real estate coach and community leader with offices in the San Francisco Bay Area and Sac County. I'm Christina Morales, I'm a writer, I'm a marketer, and I hope that I will be a real estate investor. So Rick, this uh, came out of our conversations about how can we be financially secure in the future? And I said, help, Rick, what yeah. do I do? And, and so we started this series. It, Christina, this series is actually my favorite. You know, during Shelter in Place, we did uh, about 20 different videos, uh, interviews, and for the small business owner, for the real estate agent. Uh, this is the topic I've been excited to talk about. Uh, I love real estate. It's a passion of mine. It has been. It's not just my passion. I don't know if I ever told you this, but my grandfather uh, was a real estate broker. And, um, and so I kind of followed in his footsteps and learned about real estate. And I've had the privilege of helping nearly a thousand people buy and sell real estate, invest in real estate. And what I've owned about every type of property you can imagine, from VRBO to long-term rentals to commercial property, in-state, out-of-state, uh, short-term, long-term rentals, buy flips, buy holds, and everything in between. And I just can't wait to share some thoughts with you. And you know, last week uh, we talked about, and if you didn't hear this podcast, like you really want to get this, it's really the heartbeat behind what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea of why become a real estate investor, right? Like why even do it? And you and I talked about that the world has changed and that our grandfather and grandmother, they probably retired and had a financial plan based on a pension, a pension plan. They worked for the same company uh, for 30 years. My grandfather worked in Richmond, another grandfather worked in Richmond and he um, made shingles. And so uh, when he retired, he had a pension plan. Uh, many of our parents utilized a 401k or our parents' generation. That was pretty common. Uh, today, a lot of people are gig workers. A lot of people are independent contractors. A lot of people are self-employed. They may not have that 401k, and even many companies aren't providing that as an option. And so really what we're saying is that in our generation, if you want to have some sort of financial security, if you want to have financial peace in the future, it really is up to you. And real estate is not the only way, but it's a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a past conversation, we talked about the four R's to a realtor's million dollars. And while this isn't just for realtors, it's for anybody. And you talked right. about how there's four buckets that we need to fill. And so if you haven't seen that, go on our website, rickfuller.com. You can find it there. Um, Agents Thrive and InvestorsThrive.com. It's there, your YouTube channel. So uh, that's a critical uh, precursor to this webinar today, oh. this podcast. Well, it is. I mean, you start with the heartbeat. Like, why do it? Like, mm -hmm. why even begin this conversation? And how has it changed over the course of generations? And then you say, okay, well, how, then let's start talking about how to do it. And you realize there's four main categories that we call them the four R's. And yes, one of those R's is real estate, but honestly, it's not the only R. And it's critical you know all four because all four of them, you know, it's not just one slice of the pie. You got to get the whole pie going. And um, the four R's... Uh, provide a holistic approach to a financial plan. Primarily, this topic is about one of those R's, which is the real estate plan. But, you know, the four R's after we shot that podcast, it was so cool. I had several people um, reach out to me and say, hey, can I spend five minutes with you and talk about how the four R's are working for me and where I'm at with each one of them? And, and we honored that, you know, sure, you bet. We, we spent some time with some people. And I've been doing that now for 10 years, mostly writing it out on a scratch piece of paper, a cocktail napkin. I can remember there's a rest where I would go to a restaurant, meet somebody, and I would write it out on the napkin in the restaurant. And now we can kind of go live and share that with real estate investors. And so they can use it, especially real estate agents, because as independent contractors, if they don't prepare for their financial future, nobody else will. Mm -hmm. uh, there isn't a 401k. There isn't 
a, a company adding to their retirement plan. If it is to be, it's up to me. You got to get working on it. And the goal of that call was like, let's go to work. It's time to start working on these things. Don't wait till you're in your 60s and 70s or even in your 80s and you start thinking about it. Start as early as you can and get, get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. So I'm so excited for today's topic. It's 10 ways to begin as an investor. So now you're going to start, we're going to dip our foot into the pool, our toe into the yeah. pool and figure out, okay, how do we do this? And like I said, this is such a meaty topic. This is, we're going to be talking about this for the next few months because there's so much at stake and there's so much to learn. So this is just our first little step into it. So, uh, and I'm going to give you 10 ways to become a real estate investor today. And then Christina, you and I are going to have to take uh, a podcast and then break down these because there's so much and it's impossible. And one thing that you and I always lack is enough time to cover <laughs> the topic we're discussing. Um, so today I'm going to try to go through and you, you help me be as expedient as we can, but I want to talk about 10 ways to start becoming a real estate investor. If you're already a real estate investor, maybe some of these things you can do to better your real estate investment portfolio. If you're not an investor, um, then here's 10 ways you could start. And I'm gonna start the easiest way that I know how. And the first way to start is buy your own first home. Like buy a house for yourself and your family. Um, what I love about this option um, is that you own real estate. You have an asset that you own, even if you're living in it. Now, some mm -hmm. would say, well, it's your primary residence. It's not an investment. I, I totally disagree with that. If you look at how you would define an investment, an investment is something that provides you a future benefit. I have met Christina with a thousand homeowners and helped them buy or sell real estate. And I've learned that there's a future benefit of owning real estate. And conversely, not owning real estate is hazardous to your wealth. So maybe the first baby step for someone who's listening to this, it's like, I wanna become a real estate investor. How do I do that? Well, the first step is to buy your own first home. And one of the reasons I like that is there are major benefits to buying a property as your primary residence. And one of those benefits is there are some good write-offs, right? You could write off the mortgage interest deduction, you uh, write off the property taxes, reducing your taxable income. I love that. If it's your mm -hmm. primary residence and you live in it for two of the past five years and you decide to sell it, you have up to $250,000 of capital gains exclusions. What does that mean? Well, it goes up in value. You gain equity. Maybe you pay down the mortgage and that gain becomes uh, non-taxable, tax-free. Uh, so I love that. That doesn't exist on the, on the investment side, but it exists on the primary residence. So you have that benefit. Um, one of the things I love about it is you get a better interest rate. If you're going to use financing for buying your first home and, uh, or buying a property to live in, you're able to get a really good low interest rate because you're buying it as your primary residence. Our very first investment home, was the home that Jennifer and I, my wife, Jennifer and I lived in. And it allowed us to be able to own the home. We still own that home today. Really? We were able to find that property and then bring in a tenant. And what was really cool about it is we could look for the right tenant that met the right qualif financial qualifications. We didn't have to be in a rush. And then we moved out, they moved in, so there was no vacancy, right? So like it was a weekend. We moved out one weekend, they moved in the next. Mm -hmm. And you can do that with your primary residence very easily. But probably my favorite thing about using a primary residence and buying your first home is that if you decide to make it a rental property later on, and let's say it doesn't work for you. Say, so you know what, this rental business just isn't for me or this real estate investment business isn't for me. Um, mm -hmm. If you do that and you sell it within three years of you moving out, you could sell it as if it was your primary residence. So you could, in some sense, give it a try, see what happens. You don't like it, move the tenant out, sell the property. And as long as you do that within three years from the time you moved out of the home, qualify for the, the IRS code 121, gives you up to $250,000 if you're single, $500,000 of capital gain exclusion if you're married. So the first thing I would do is to tell you, buy your own first home. 
And by the way, I realized this early on that, um, you know, when I was renting a home in my early 20s, I realized I was a pretty good tenant. I always paid my rent on time. Um, I, I always paid it in full. Uh, I was never late on my rent. And I thought, how do I benefit from a tenant like me? Well, I'm going to buy my own home. I'm going to pay my mortgage on time. In some sense, I'm benefiting from me paying my rent on time. And in this case, I'm now paying my mortgage on time. And so buying your first home is a baby step to begin the process of real estate investing. And a lot of times what we find, Christina, is that how do you come up with the equity? And people always ask me, how do I come up with the down payment? How do I come up with the, well, a lot of times it takes owning a property or two to accumulate that equity, begin to grow that equity and you sell that home. And now maybe instead of um, buying another primary residence, you buy a primary residence and an investment property. And that's how a lot of people have done it. They didn't start off putting $100,000 as a down payment. They just, they owned property, it appreciated, it went up in value, they paid down their mortgage, it created equity, they sold property, and now instead of buying one, they bought two or bought three. And that's how they began that process. And over time, that begins to multiply as a real estate investor, and you're able to do more and more and that's a baby step to getting started and option one is buy your own first home as a primary residence if i were to buy my first home let's say i'm just starting out what percentage of the total price should i put down well one of the benefits um and, and there's a whole discussion on this like for investors i recommend to do a 15-year mortgage uh we're kind of we swim upstream when it comes to investing in real estate. A lot of investors talk about, I'm going to do an arm because I get the lower interest rate, or I'm going to do interest only because I'm going to flip it. I, I want to pay them off. Like I want to own it free and clear because I discovered that 100% of the foreclosures have a mortgage mm -hmm. and I want to own it free and clear. And so how am I going to own the property free and clear? The fastest way for me to do that is with a 15 year mortgage. And so I like that. But one of the benefits that you will find in buying a home that you're going to live in, the baby step to becoming a real estate investor, is I'm not obligated to make that 20% down payment. There are programs of conventional financing as low as 5% down, or FHA is 3.5%, or VA is 100% is financing. There's no down payment at all on a VA, a veteran's loan. In other words, the buying a home as your primary residence opens up a lot more options for you as a real estate investor. And, and the investing of rental property and commercial property and Airbnb, all that stuff's gonna come down the road. But this is kind of a baby step into the world of real estate investing. You get to have the best resident of the property, which is you, mm -hmm. because it's your equity and you're paying your mortgage on time. And if you buy it right, and we have to spend more time on this topic. If you buy it right, Christina, the, the game changer is that we buy it right and we pay down the principal balance, and then we begin to accelerate that. And mm -hmm. what you end up finding is you start accelerating, you get to a point where you can pay the house off free and clear, and now you have cash flow income that's coming in that becomes a game changer. And a first baby step, buy your own first home, move into it you know, live there in that property, raise a family, right? But like start to own real estate in that capacity. And it's a baby step into becoming a real estate investor. Okay, well, I'm on then step two. This is our first home. Perfect. Uh, we've lived here 18 years. And since then we've had two munchkins who are just jamming the place up with toys and clothes and we need a bigger place. Yep. So we want, so what do we do now? I know that this is step two. Yep. Okay, we have our first house. We want something bigger. What do we do? So let's let's kind of use that as an example, if you don't mind. What I found is that most people's first home, it's not their dream home, right? It's absolutely <laughs> like it's it's less about what I want. It's more about what I can afford. Like their first right. home, and what I found is that sometimes that means they're a little smaller. Okay, maybe they're 13, 14, 1500 square feet. Our first home was 
1,398 square feet, right? Three bedrooms, two and a half bath, two story. Um, and so it's a little smaller. Sometimes because my budget is tight, it has less upgrades. And it doesn't have some of the amenities that I wanted maybe in a dream home, right? It's my first home. Right. So I buy a home and it doesn't have a pool. Uh, I buy a home and it doesn't have that huge backyard. Well, Christina, right. what I'm describing here is a perfect investment property. Mm -hmm. Do you see it? Like if I'm going to buy a rental home, a single family home, I don't want to buy a, a huge 4,000 square foot property because the more square foot on the home, the more carpet and the bigger the air conditioners are, the big, more cabinets, more bathrooms. And in the event that they're damaged or need repair, I have more liability. So I kind of mm -hmm. like the smaller three bedroom, two bath home. Sound familiar? Most people's first home. I like the properties without a pool because if I have a pool on a rental property, what do I have to do? I have to maintain it. <laughs> and I have a pool here at our home now and it's a full-time job. Real estate is my part-time job. <laughs> pool filters is my full-time job. Uh -huh. And so I have to maintain it and I have a liability, right? If I don't have the proper fencing and alarm systems and stuff, stuff associated with that. Uh, right. Let's take it further. If I own, buy my first home, it probably has a small lot. I didn't yeah. buy it because it uh, had a small lot. I bought it because it was affordable and it allowed me to be able to get into the owning ownership market. Uh, but now that becomes very valuable because it's less, it's easier to maintain. It's less landscape. My first home tends to be in an area and at a price point and it has a floor plan that the majority of tenants want. That's a benefit to me if I decide to rent it. Why? Because I can take that property and I can put it on the market as a, a rental home and I, can, and I can get a lot of applicants. Now I can pick and choose the best applicant that's financially qualified for that property. And mm -hmm. I can pick an applicant that has a good credit score, and a good income and a solid employment and is likely to pay the rent on an ongoing basis. If I have more than one applicant, I can choose from. If I have a, a unique out of the box uh, or a very large home or a home with a lot of amenities that ends up increasing the rental amount, I may not have that many applicants. So the, your first home is a perfect property to transition into a rental home. And let's say if you and your family decided to move, you bought another property and you moved into it, you didn't sell your home. And I know where your home is at, which is a perfect market, what we're describing. Mm -hmm. And if you decided to rent your home, and let's say two years later, you said, Rick, I don't know, this isn't right for us. So we want to get our equity back out of the home. We want to sell it. I don't want to be a real estate investor. I can still sell it with the benefits, the tax benefits, you know, that two of the past five years living in your home as your primary residence makes it tax free. Well, that means that you could be departed from your home for three years, right? Okay. And so you have a kind of an opportunity to test out the water, stick your toes in the real estate investment world. And by the way, we've been in a market here in the San Francisco Bay Area in Sacramento County that's been appreciating literally for the last 12 years. Like yeah. the values of real estate have gone nothing but, so now you have two homes that are going up. Or if you follow this strategy, you have three or four or maybe six or eight or even 10 properties that are going up in value uh, rapidly. And as a result of that, you're gaining greater equity. So the second way to start this process is take the home that you're in, and often that property is a perfect rental home. It doesn't have much of upgrades. It's often not extremely large. It's often in a market where a lot of people want to live. It's often very desirable when it comes to renting a property. You think about, you know, and we try not to get into the numbers too much on these calls, but this is an investment call, so we can kind of dive into it a little bit. But if I rented in the Bay Area a 4,000 square foot home, I, I might get 80 cents a square foot in rent. Maybe I can rent it for $3,000 a month, right? Maybe $3,200 a month. But if I had a 1,500 square foot home, I'm gonna get $1.25 or $1.30 in rent. 
In other words, for every square foot, I'm gonna get a little bit more rental income. And there's a, there's a crossover at about 2,000, 2,200 square feet, and every market's a little bit different, where it hits about a dollar a square foot. And if I'm an investor, I wanna squeeze out every available dollar out of every square foot that I have. I wanna have less risk, I wanna have greater financial benefits to being in a real estate investor, and the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to have a moderate size. Mm -hmm. And so your first primary residence, you're ready to move, maybe as you're in your case, couple of kids, not ready for something a little bigger, maybe something a little bit different, maybe a little bit different neighborhood, different community, different school district, whatever, that primary residence can become an excellent way to begin your process and begin your pathway to becoming a real estate investor. If I keep my home as a rental, how do I have my down payment for my next house? So, and remember you're buying your primary residence. So we're able mm -hmm. to benefit from the, the large pool of available financing. So there are options uh, where you could put 5% down. There are options where you could do you know, FHA, maybe even a VA loan, depending on the scenario. Uh, so you don't have to put that large down payment. For others, when they bought their first home, finances were really tight. Their career has grown and adapted, and now they can put what we recommend, which is 20% down for a property. You don't have mm -hmm. to do that, but if you do that, there's some benefits like dropping mortgage insurances right. and things like that, and we're able to do that but your primary residence does open up the opportunity for you to use financing, utilize financing, um, where you need less of a down payment. By the way, if you were to switch and go out and just buy an investment property, uh, then you're probably going to need a much larger down payment. You're likely going to need 20% down on an investment. And you're gonna face a little higher interest rate. If you were to take your primary residence, make that home, say your first home, a rental property, and then you were to buy your new home, okay, and then you were able to secure great financing many, many years ago on buying your first home, perhaps that's a primary residence, low interest rate, excellent financing, and you're able to secure now excellent financing on your acquisition, on your purchase of your new home. And now you have two great loan products, and that's a a game changer because when you don't have the right uh, loan on your property, uh, this interest only business, this adjustable rate uh, risk, uh, all of that, frankly, I think is, is a, it's a trap for real estate investors. You wanna get this property paid off as quickly as you can. Oh, interest rate, what, what that means, and if you have a 15 year mortgage, every payment you pay, you're paying more to the principal balance, accomplishing that goal, paying off that home quicker. So you don't recommend pulling out equity from one home to put it as a down payment for another? I don't, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, because markets change, right? We saw this, you know, we've been on a 12, 12 year bull run on the real estate market. What I mean by that is it's just got nothing but gone up in value. Yeah. Uh, even during shelter in place, we looked at what was happening in Sacramento and throughout the San Francisco Bay Area, you and I did an entire webinar on that. Mm -hmm. And what we talked about was that values of real estate, median home prices, every month during shelter in place went up. It was, it's completely shocking that values right. of continue to go up like that, even in times where the unemployment went up and at the time stock market went down and real median real estate values have gone up. I wasn't mm -hmm. talking about sales. Sales are up, were impacted during shelter in place, coronavirus, there were less sales occurring. I'm talking about the actual median price of the property. And if you look, most people find that their home is worth more today than what it was three months ago or six months ago or even a year ago. Yeah. So let's move on to point three then. So, okay. so what's so, next? Yeah. So option one, we're talking about baby steps, right? Like Get yes. Go in the water, small down payments, great interest rates. You're buying your first home. You're living there. Mm -hmm. you're paying mortgage. Then you're you're taking that home. You're moving out, and now what you're doing is you're renting out that 
primary residence that you had, and now mm -hmm. you're moving to another home. And I love that option. It's one of my favorites, to be honest with you. And mm -hmm. it gives people a, just an opportunity to kind of dabble in this a little bit and begin to get acclimated. You know, we talked about this on a previous uh, podcast that the, the one of the main uh, components to becoming a real estate investor is how you think. You have to become, you have to think differently. Um, mm -hmm. And as you do that, there's a learning curve like anything. And as you learn new, a new way to think about real estate, new way to think about investment, a new way to think about uh, your retirement plan, as you begin to do that, there's a learning curve. This gives mm -hmm. you an opportunity to kind of experience that learning curve just a little bit in a really in a safeguard approach. So here's a third option. You can do it with a partner. Okay? Okay. You can do it with a partner. It's another baby step, right? You don't have to do it by yourself. Now, you could do that as a joint venture, okay? You could do that with what we call tenants in common, uh, which, which is called a TIC or a tenants in common agreement. Uh, let's say that you and I were to buy a property together, okay? Jennifer and I and you and I, and something were to happen to me and I held the property as tenants in common, we bought the property, then okay. my share of the property doesn't go to you like, like in a marriage, but it actually goes to my wife, Jennifer, or to my heirs or my children, right? Mm -hmm. And so from an investment side, we can do what's called a tenants in common agreement, which okay. preserves my share of the investment. Are you following this? Mm -hmm. So it preserves that. And if something, heaven forbid, were to happen to you, your share of the investment would go to Vinny or go to your kids, depending on mm -hmm. how you in other words, we can preserve that, um, ec that, that investment uh, ownership for your family. Unlike when you buy your home, maybe with your spouse, the old community property, you have joint tenants, something happens to one, the other person owns 100% of the property. We can mm -hmm. do that differently when it comes to investing. Now, you could buy it as an LLC. We see this mm -hmm. a lot. A limited liability company. And what does that do? Well, it allows, let's say you and I were to buy a property together. Hey, Rick, uh, you're good at renting it. and I'm going to assume you're a good painter and you'll do the painting and I'll do the renting of the home and I'll have management responsibilities and you'll have maintenance responsibilities and let's go buy this home. And we could actually structure an entity, an okay. LLC entity that allows us to be able to buy the property together. And I have certain responsibilities as a managing partner, and you have certain responsibilities as a maintenance partner, and we can hold the property in an LLC. And uh, one of the benefits to holding a property in an LLC is just what the name describes. It limits the liability. And in, in, unless you pierce that corporate veil, it limits the liability within the LLC. Right. And so a lot of people like that as an option. and so. Uh, you can buy a property with uh, a partner. Now, one of the things that you want to make sure if you do decide to go this route, and I've done this before, is that the partner is on the same page as you. And, and not just on the same page, but on the same page long term. Let me give you an example. If you buy a property and your aspirations are to hold it for 20 years, and somebody else's aspirations are only to hold it for 10, mm. it can be problematic. And mm -hmm. it may not be a timely uh, departure of that partner. And you'll have to, you could buy out their share, that other 50% uh, of the property. We're talking about two partners to make it simple, but it could be more. But you can buy out their share. And that's something you could do. But you got to make sure that they're on the same page. Um, one of the challenges that can happen with a partner is, let's say I'm not doing enough uh, management work, and you're doing a lot of maintenance work, or vice versa, right? And then there can be kind of a inequity, if you will, of the relationship. I'm mm -hmm. putting a little bit more work, you're not putting in as much. And so it can cause conflict. So you wanna make sure if you're going to use the partnership strategy that your time horizon, your investment strategy, your business plan, you know, why you're holding it, how long you're gonna hold it, what you're gonna rent it for, who does what, clearly defined. If you don't clearly define these roles, um, having a partnership can be very, very problematic. And it could actually, just, a lot of people do it with a good friend. They'll buy a property mm -hmm. and a good friend. 
and then it can become um, a burden on the relationship. And uh, I, I don't think it's worth that. And so it's got to be just the right situation in which to have a partner. But what it can do is divide the cost 50%. You know, if you look at the cost of a property, you generally break them down into three sections. What's the cost to acquire it? What's the cost to hold it and improve it and repairs? And, and then what's the cost to keep it, right? Like, what are my three costs? And so then we're able to kind of take those costs and divide it. And later on, we might even add the fourth cost. What's the cost to relinquish it or to sell it? Okay. And so we can divide those costs by 50%. And you can share in some of those costs, and I'll share in some of those costs. Uh, and if you buy it right, we can work through a mortgage to end up paying down or paying off the mortgage in its entirety during the course of the ownership of the property. How do you recommend finding the right partner? Because I, you don't want two people who have never invested before to go in on it. It's just going to be a mess. So it do you really get a is. moderator, or do you? How do you find the right partner? Well, I think that. Frankly, I don't think it can, you would have to have a unique, special relationship with that person for it to make sense. Uh, I don't, I do not think it, it is that it generally works out to bring in somebody that you don't know. And there's a lot of people that do it and they're going to argue, hey, I can, but we, you just don't know their time horizon. You just don't know their portion of the role, what your portion of the role is. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a very special relationship to say, we are on the same page. We're going to buy this property. We're going to hold it together. This is our time horizon. Uh, this is my role. This is your role. And, and that conversation takes a very special person uh, in your life and somebody that's going to stick around, right? Like if one person moves out of town and so they're supposed to be maintaining the property, now who's going to maintain it? Mm -hmm. right? And if one person moves out and they're supposed to be managing the home or, or providing a tenant and, and advertising, but who's going to do that? And so, and you say, well, today we're on the same page. Well, it's not about today. It's what's going to happen in five years, seven years, 10 years down the road. And so it does take a very uh, special partnership to make this work. And it's why, um, although it is an option, it's often not my favorite option because it takes that role that has to be yeah. so uniquely specific to that person to make it work. Mm -hmm. So what's number four then? So All right. So here's number four, and we've got to move a little quicker, don't us? Don't we? <laughs> As always. Or make this into two parts because there's so well, I want to cover them all, and then okay. there's so much more, Christina. I want to go into every one of them in depth. <laughs> because I there there's so much I'm just skimming over like and I, I want your questions and those types of things because it helps us be able to answer some of the concerns of the people that are listening to this podcast. Right. So number four, and I'm thinking okay, and here's how I structured these, like baby steps. What's the easiest ones to get into? Here's another option: buy a property out of state. Out of state doesn't have to be in California. We're in the Bay Area, San Francisco. Property values are pretty expensive here, right? Uh, you know, and and um, can be very, very expensive. That's not the case around the country. Now, you can buy a property. Jennifer and I have owned homes out of the, the state of California. You can buy a property out of the state of California, usually at a fraction of the price of what a Bay Area home is. It doesn't even have to be out of the state. Could be be just be out of perhaps the Bay Area and Sacramento County, where home values are typically more expensive. Uh, San Francisco is specifically deemed one of the most expensive places to own real estate in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if you're stepping into becoming a real estate investor and you're looking at these price points, and maybe they they're in the high six six figure or even seven figure price points, and you're like, wow, that's a huge step. It is. So maybe we start with a property out of state. And if you hire, if you get a property out of state, you're likely going to need a property manager. And uh, that's going to be critical. When you have a property in state, and I use the example of the LLC that I'll do the management, you do the maintenance, like you can begin to do those things. The vacancy, you could show up and you can make the repairs or I, I love having home warranty companies make the repairs. It's one of the things that we often put on an investment property as a home warranty. 
when you buy it out of state, you do need to get the right property manager. Now, I'm convinced that if you buy a property out of state, it is, um, it is absolutely imperative that you have the, the right property manager. Like as, as much as you've scrutinized the home and the area, you need to vet a good property manager. A good property manager is gonna be able to give you accurate rental amounts. It's gonna be able to maintain and manage that property on a consistent basis. They're gonna make sure that you're always receiving market rent. They're gonna make sure that there's a minimized vacancy. They're gonna make repairs and ongoing inspections of the home. And buying a property out of state can be a baby step in buying an investment property. And what I, one of the things I love about uh, buying properties out of state, and uh, Jennifer and I own properties out of state, is it becomes purely an investment decision, which is one of the challenges that I find with real estate investors. Like they'll walk through the home and they'll, oh, I just love this property. And I, oh, it's so beautiful. And, well, we're looking at it from an investment lens, not from uh, I'm going to live here lens. Now, I think it should be habitable. I'm not advocating that you be a slumlord, any of that. I'm just saying that you have to look at it from an investment viewpoint. And when you buy properties out of state, what uniquely emerges is whether it's a good investment. Because it's then less about how beautiful the home is or less about the subjective amenities that you like or don't like or whatever. It's more about the numbers and the finances and whether it makes sense or not to buy. But it can be a baby step into buying the next property and it can kind of help you get your toes in the water. And it's not uncommon to find properties out of state that are right in the $100,000 price point, which makes a 20% down payment, makes a 15 year mortgage. Uh, it makes a home that can cash flow on a 15 year mortgage make a lot of sense. And so mm -hmm. we can begin down those roads of, of looking at other options. And a lot of times I'll meet with somebody in the Bay Area like, okay, we're just getting started. And I go through these, these four, and that becomes a viable solution. I thought I never even thought about buying a property out of state. You're still buying real estate. You're still buying it with limited value. Now, there's a whole conversation on what that looks like. And what's mm -hmm. the economy? You know, I bought a property one time in uh, San Antonio, Texas. And it was very dependent on the local Air Force base. As a matter of fact, all of my tenants were in the military. And so if something were to happen to that major economy, right. I may be, you know, if there was only one employer in an area, for example, that factory closes or that military base closes or whatever the case might be, you want to know these things, right? You want to know about taxes. You want to know about what you can and can't do with the home. You'll want to know about the area. You'll want to know about the appreciation. You want to know about the rental market. So we're going to dive into this on how to buy property out of state, but it's an option that you can consider. Uh, let's go to number five. Okay. Okay, baby steps, right? Just baby right. steps. Rick, how do I do this? Another option is you could buy a condo or a townhome. Well, why would that make sense? Well, some of the concerns that people have about um, owning real estate is the maintenance of it, right? Oh mm -hmm. my goodness, the roof. What if the roof goes out? I'm going to repair the roof. Oh my goodness, what if it has dry rot? Oh, how do I maintain the landscaping? What about, you know, sprinkler breaks? I gotta... Well, by owning a condo or townhome, you're paying into a HOA, a Homeowners mm -hmm. Association. And I love that option because for starting out as a real estate investor, that's the topic of this. How do I become a real estate investor? Mm -hmm. You buy a condo, and generally, the exterior of the property is being maintained. Generally, the landscaping out front is being maintained. If there is a pool, it's up to code, and you know they, they clean, maintain the pool. If they got the proper security measures, and you're renting really the sheetrock in. And so, I love that as a kind of a baby step to becoming a real estate investor. Now, there's a couple of caveats that you want to be aware of, and we'll dive into this when we get into this topic later on, but you also want to make sure that it's acceptable to the homeowners association that you rent the home. Some HOAs have a limitation. Matter of fact, certain financing dictates that it has so many owner-occupied users. 
like so many people live there as their primary residence. They can only have so many <clears throat> investment units. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can only have so many investment units. So we want to make sure that there's not a waiting list for investors. We got to check that. Um, we want to make sure that if pets are a part of your rental application, that we can make sure we can honor that by having a property that accommodates pets. Uh, you'll want to make sure you factor in the homeowners association dues associated um, with your cash flow, making sure that you've calculated. But this can be a baby step, and generally speaking, condos, townhomes uh, across the country sell at a fraction of the price of what you would sell for uh, a single family residence. And so it can be a baby step in shifting a lot of the liability of the HOA, a lot of the liability of the management, a lot of the liability of the maintenance over to a homeowner's association um, that can manage the exterior of the property, the pools, tennis courts, whatever, gated community. And a lot of people like that. But, and it also typically has a number of applicant applications and most people view it as a step up from an apartment, right? Whether that's accurate or not, but they view it as a step up like a townhome, they would view as a step up from their local apartment where they're used to. So they're, they're kind of getting something that's a little bit more um, unique to them, maybe has a few more amenities, maybe has a little better architectural style. Uh, and often that exists in a condo or a townhome and um, can create a large tenant pool, a pool of applicants ready to pursue your property. Mm -hmm. Is it easier to find a property manager when it's a condo or a townhome? Because it seems like they would have more people renting or you can have a connection with the HOA that can uh, totally. recommend something. Okay. Absolutely. And it, it often means that you have less maintenance responsibility. Mm -hmm. And some of the responsibilities, especially with, you know, the ex around the property, you know, that think, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, some time ago, there was a, a law that changed that uh, required you to put alarms on if you had a pool. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to put alarms, you had to put certain gates, you had to certain locks, you had certain, there were certain heights of the gate that were responsible. You know, you got to have them so far away from the property. Well, if you're in a condo or a townhome, the assumption would be that the homeowners association that usually has the HOA management company, they're on top of it, they're, they're making those accommodations through the collective HOA fees that come in from all the owners of the property. And so you're less you're, you're, you're mm -hmm. you know, less dependent on having to make those adjustments that you would have to make if it's a single family home and it's all up to you. And it's a mm -hmm. baby step to getting into investing in real estate. Okay, so what's the next baby step? All right, so we keep going. So here's another one, how about a duplex? Now you have, Okay. So a du so you can have a duet. A duet means you only own one side of it. Okay. okay. You think about we're talking about a, a structure with two units. Usually mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be, but usually they're kind of a mirror image, right? They're opposite sides. Right. And you come in and maybe you'd have a kitchen and then a couple of bedrooms and a bathroom, right? Like it's and it's a that's a, a duet you own half, but a duplex you would own the whole. Now here's what a lot of people do. They say, Well, I'm gonna buy get my first investment property, I'm gonna buy a duplex. I'm gonna live in one and I'll rent out the other. And there's a lot of benefits in doing that, right? And um, you know, some of the benefits might be, uh, might be easier to monitor that, that tenant. Like you're right there next to them, right? If, and if mm -hmm. you know, they're not maintaining, if the property needs maintenance, then you're able to maintain it, right? Uh, if you're replacing your roof, you're replacing your tenant's roof at the same time likely, right? Um, so some of the downsides or negative aspects of maybe a duplex, in that environment might be that hey if your tenant knocks on the door hey yeah my toilet's leaking would you come over and make the repair okay well <laughs> now's not a good time right um but um often that's a very easy baby step and often you could put one finance mm -hmm. there is one loan to accommodate both units okay. rent off half. now it doesn't even have to be a duplex what about a home with two houses on one lot that's mm -hmm. pretty common. And so you could rent, live in one and rent out the other. The idea here is that this is a very easy way to begin the process of moving into becoming a real estate investor. And let's say you're living in a single family house now. You decide not to do what we called option one or two, which was to rent out your primary residence. 
and you sold it and then you bought a duplex or you sold it and you bought two houses on one lot. Mm -hmm. uh, if you did that, now we're taking a baby step into the world of real estate investing. You still have a tenant, you, you, you are managing that property, you really have an on-site property manager, it just happens to have your name right on that property manager's name tag, um, mm -hmm. and, but it's a baby step to get into it. And those that are really nervous about getting into the real estate investment business, this can help you get acclimated to the world of real estate investment. Very, very easy. I like that because I keep thinking that real estate investment means buying another house like I already have. I'm like, how am I going to carry two mortgages? And so you don't this, have to with the duplex. Yeah, this makes sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. So let's go to option number seven, or, or you know, that's there. I'm giving you 10 ways to take, and we're just kind of going it progressively into baby steps, right? Just taking baby steps. What makes it easier to become a real estate investor? Uh, number seven is we go buy a single family residence. Now, by the way, this is my favorite. I love single family homes. And there's many reasons. And, and this would actually mean that you actually go and pursue and find a single family home to buy, and you're going to make it an investment property. Mm -hmm. And I like it for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is that I found that I typically get longer term tenants in a single family home than I do a condo or townhome. Mm -hmm. My experience, the condo or townhome, after 12 months, 24 months, the tenant's moving up. We have tenants that have been in our properties for over 10 years, our single family. Really? One wow. of the benefits I like to single family homes is that they tend to enjoy two big, what I call pools. Not a pool you swim in, but a pool of applicants. The first pool of applicants that you enjoy is in a single family home, if you buy the right kind of home, it tends to be a good first time home buyer home, right? Like we talked mm -hmm. about that at the beginning. Right. What it looks like to buy a good investment property is very similar to that of a home that most people buy as their first home. It's not their dream home, it's not their forever home. It's simply a home that they're going to move into. They can afford it and they start out this process of one real estate. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that it, it it can so it can provide first time home a first time home buyer pool now if you look at the market christina you find the bulk in almost every community of buyers in the market are buying their first home right really hmm. and so so if i can get a lot of people that want to buy that kind of home mm -hmm. what do you think happens to the value over time on that property it tends yeah, to go cool. up and mm -hmm. if you think about it, the homes that are really unique are the homes that are kind of, you know, really a large home, luxury home, large estates, um, those tend to have greater fluctuation. Sometimes there aren't buyers in a given community for those luxury estates. But I have always found that there are buyers for those that are buying their first home. Mm -hmm. and that, that begins to kind of change how you think about buying a single family home because you have that pool of first time home buyers, which tends to help preserve the value of the property. And economies go up, economies go down, and that we've seen that certainly over the last uh, several months. But there seems to always be a pool of people that are wanting to buy their first home. Maybe they don't want to buy a lake house. Maybe they don't want to buy an estate. Maybe they don't want to buy a beach house because those markets tend to fluctuate a little bit more. But they want to buy their first home. And so a single family residence can help do it. The second pool that you enjoy when you own a single family home is there are a lot of families uh, and an FBA family. It could be certainly individuals or couples or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people that want to buy, or, pardon me, rent a single family home. Three bedroom, two bath, two car garage. In almost every community, there's usually a couple of homes that are being rented. So you enjoy these two large pools of applicants. The applicant okay. that wants to buy it and the applicant that wants to rent it. When you, when you have both of those, it tends to preserve value. It tends to help you get the right tenant that's financially qualified to make the, the, pay the rent. And that's going to stay in the property and helps you be able to get a tenant that's going to help you. It. And these two pools exist in the single family residence that may not exist uh, on your luxury estates. And so I really like those single family residence. 
that podcast is probably going to take us two or three because I got a lot more to share on that. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So what comes next? All right. So let me go back to my list here. Uh, so next, ah, uh, the Airbnb. So the Airbnb is just exploded. And when I say Airbnb, Airbnb is one brand. You know, if we asked for a tissue, you might hand me a Kleenex. Or if I said, can you make a coffee? We might say make a Xerox, right? Well, those are all brands. Airbnb is a brand. Airbnb is a rental management company. It's a portal that you can uh, put a property and they'll help you find uh, uh, renters for the property. And usually they're guests. And usually they're staying for a weekend or maybe a week. Right. And they're typically known as short-term, short-term rentals. Where the single family home was really kind of a, you know, we do a lease agreement. Lease, by the way, is Latin for a year. So it's a one-year agreement. Okay. That you would not do that with a rental, with a with an Airbnb. That's a short-term rental. Matter of fact, it, it would be common for you to rent it out for the weekend or for a week or maybe even just for a couple of weeks. And the um, Airbnbs could be Airbnb, could be VRBO, could be Homeway. Expedia, TripAdvisor, their bookings, they're all uh, participating in helping you book the property. And typically, you want to find a community that has a point of attraction. And um, that's a big factor in, in having an Airbnb. Now, that point of attraction, if you're next to Disneyland, mm -hmm. you have an Airbnb, my guess is that people are searching in that area to go to Disneyland and they're going to stay at your Airbnb. And with an Airbnb, it could be that you rent out a certain part of the house or you could rent out the entire home, home away, same kind of concept. Uh, you typically rent out a portion or all of the home. And so if you buy a property and you're looking at the Airbnb, you're going to buy it by, by perhaps a, a, an amusement park. You're probably going to see people that want to go to that amusement park. If you buy it next to a college, you might see parents of college students come in and stay at the Airbnb as their kids are attending college. Uh, if you buy it next to a beach or a lake or in the mountains, right, there could be this mm -hmm. short-term rental environment where you can buy it. And those could be kind of a combination of all the things I've mentioned. It could be a single family home. It could be, uh, it could be a condo. It could be a town home. It could be any number of things. And there's a lot of things that we want to look at when you look at an Airbnb or a VRBO or home away. Uh, one of them is what's the market look like? And so today it's really easy to see what the market looks like. So you could go to a, we'll use VRBO. It's one of my favorite. You could type in a community. You could type in a community, and we use Disneyland as an example. We could look at Anaheim, and then I could see their calendars. How full are their calendars? If I see their calendars have a lot of vacancies, I don't know that I want to go and add my property to that list. But mm -hmm. if I can't find a place over and over and over, and I'm looking at the rental income, which is generally on a, when you break it down to a daily basis, rent per night, right, with a VRBO. Right. In contrast to a single family home, you might do on a lease, which is a, you know, you pay monthly. You'll actually make more money, but there's more involvement too. You're going to have to clean the property. You have to work with the right. short-term tenants. You might have four tenants in a month instead of one when you have a VRBO. And so we want to look at that market. Is there availability in that market? Or is there, what's going to happen when I add my property? Am I just going to be amongst all the other vacancies? Or do I fill the need of the market? Mm -hmm. um, one of the properties that we own as a VRBO, uh, we look to make it all inclusive. So how can we bring in a pool table, ping pong table, games, fireplaces, flat screen TV, where people just want to come because every other mm -hmm. place tend to have just a place to sleep and then you have to go do something outside of of the property. So how do we bring it, make it inclusive where they want to stay? Mm -hmm. If they want to stay and there's those points of interest, um, they'll want to stay at the property and you'll have more bookings. That's a market in that community. One of the Airbnbs that Jennifer and I stayed at uh, when we traveled to Yellowstone many, many uh, years ago, uh, had a game room. 
And we had a bunch of young kids with us, my daughters, and my nephew, and my nieces. They loved the game room. They'd go down and they'd play games in the game room. They had the old-fashioned Pac-Man and pinball. And that oh, was an attraction that when people were looking for a vacation, they kind of made it what I call all-inclusive from the nature of, like, there's a lot of things to do on the property. Mm-hmm. And, and that became an attraction, and that one was regularly booked. And uh, we were able to enjoy it. So we're looking at how do you kind of take baby steps? And now we're looking at the Airbnb, VRBO, home away option. Um, When we dive into this one, this one's also going to take me several podcasts to kind of go over it. I I really want to look at what's the market look like? Are people taking professional pictures or do they use their iPhone to take pictures of their property? Uh, When we brought in the drone footage and the aerial photography, and put a video together, it just, Mm -hmm. and even today, it outpaces any other property in the community, in part because it's just better advertised and better promoted. And the pictures are nice, they're professional, Mm -hmm. videos are nice. And so when you're able to put all of that together, uh, you can drive a lot more people of interest to the property. I can't wait to listen to those because I've, I mean, there's like, how do you get all of these people on board? Like, how do you find the housekeeping? How do you find the yeah. management? So talk, I can't wait to talk about this later. Let's mm-hmm. go to number nine, Christina, because I know I've got another call in about seven minutes. And so we'll <laughs> let's do a landing and I'll hit nine and then I'll go to 10. So number okay. nine is look for a long-term lease. Um, the, and we're baby steps, right? Baby steps. Right. So you buy a property and now we want to do a long-term lease. So what could you do? Well, maybe you buy a single family home. That was kind of option seven. And, mm-hmm. and instead of doing a one-year lease, like I talked about, which tends to have a tenant every you know, 12 months or, or maybe an opportunity, maybe you do a 24-month lease. Maybe you do a 36-month lease, right? And so what you're now doing is you're taking a property that you own and you're, and you're assigning a lease for two years or even three years for someone to live in that home. Now, that could be a mutual benefit. Uh, For the investor, it's a benefit because, well, you would minimize vacancy of a tenant that's secured. Uh, For a tenant, it might mean that there's some security and understanding of what their rent's going to be, even if there's an accelerator clause. What's an accelerator clause? At the end of the year, the rent's going to go up 5% or whatever the case might be, right? Um, Or it's going to go up $100 or $200, and each year it's it's going to climb just a little bit but it's certain with a tenant. And what that does is it helps investors move into a market and buy a property and know that they have real income for three months, right? You've got a lease agreement for not three months, three years or four Mm -hmm. years, right? And so that can kind of help um, level out some of the uncertainty when it comes to rental properties. All right, Mm -hmm. number 10. I love this one. I can't wait to talk to you more about this one. On commercial property, owning commercial property. And a lot of people, what's very interesting to me, I, I look out at the horizon in the small business community. And a lot of small business owners, uh, mm-hmm. they would not think to rent a home, to rent their, to, to be a tenant. They must own real estate. Then when it comes to their business, mm-hmm. they immediately rent. They don't own. And it's like, you want to own real estate. You see the value of owning real estate when it comes to your primary residence, maybe even own an investment property. Maybe you enjoy one of the 10 I'm giving you, Mm -hmm. but then you go to work and you have a small business and you don't own the building. Why not? Why why wouldn't you want to have ownership? What we call that is owner user. And so the owner is the user of the property, right? And so you own that S and you can use a lot of, a lot of just like, when you buy your first home or you buy your primary residence, there's a lot of financing options. Well, there's more financing mm-hmm. options and better financing options. If you say, I have this business, mm-hmm. and instead of leasing a building, instead of renting a building, I'm going to go buy it. And I'm actually going to have my business rent it for me. Mm-hmm. Maybe my, the business writes me a rental check every month. You go back to what I talked about at the beginning about how do we, uh, you know, if you're a great if you're a responsible person, you're paying your mortgage on time, you're paying your rent on time, how do you benefit from your own responsible responsible person, right? Like, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. Well, if you have a, a building that you own, 
you're the tenant from a commercial perspective your business you your business can pay you rent and you're able to benefit from that responsible business owner which is yourself and so smart mm-hmm. owner user right and it's like I'm, i look at the business horizon and i see most business owners that i talk to they would not think about renting a home themselves they want to own it but they don't take that line of thinking when it comes to real estate investing on the commercial side. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you could use it as an owner user. Very, very easy. Here's another one. You can do a commercial condo. And remember when I talked to you about a condo or a townhome, like all the benefits, like somebody's yeah. maintaining the exterior, somebody's maintaining the roof, uh, somebody's, you know, paving the parking lot, you know, like all of that can be maintained by mm-hmm. a commercial condo. It's not a homeowners association, but it's an owner's association. Just drop the H off. And now you have somebody that's maintaining the exterior of the property. And one of the things that I love about commercial property that tends to uh, not be the case as much as residential, but in commercial property, I can get multiple tenants. Um, if I have a commercial building and I can partition it, I might have three tenants or four tenants. Mm-hmm. I might have three or four different businesses. And when you have that, Christina, what, what emerges with these commercial tenants is you tend to have people that want to stay a little longer because you start to build a business credibility. You know, if I asked you today where the local um, grocery store is or your favorite gas station, like, mm-hmm. you know, that you're, you have that branded in your mind and you drive by and you just naturally go to that place. You know exactly where your dentist is or your doctor or whatever grocery store, your favorite gas station. I say that because you start building business credibility with that location. And if if you're the investor and you've rented it out to several different um, tenants, commercial tenants, you own a commercial building, there's an incentive for them to remain in the property. And that incentive is that goodwill that a consumer recognizes Mm -hmm. that they're there. And they want to visit them on a frequent basis. And every time a commercial business owner moves, and there could be a lot of great reasons for you to move across town, could be a million or move out of state. There could be a, there could be several great, better location, more exposure, bigger business, what bigger building, maybe it's more modern, more contemporary, whatever. Mm-hmm. One thing every one of them loses is that credibility, that, that goodwill, remembering that they were on that corner. And so as an investor, you benefit in a commercial application from those that have that goodwill. They know that they're going to be there and the business owner wanting to remain in your property, continue to pay rent and be a, a, good, a good tenant for you. Mm-hmm. Wow, Christina, I gave you 10 ways. Buy your first home, rent, it, rent out that first home, get a partner talked about out of state, we talked about condos and townhomes, duplexes, single family homes, yep. Airbnb, long-term yep. commercial property, and really everything in between. Uh, I know I went really, really fast. I will be going through and breaking these down. Like I'm going to take a whole podcast and talk about each one and how to do it. Good. <laughs> I didn't think you can do it. You proved me wrong. There you go. You won the bet. (laughs) So thank you so much, Rick. This was awesome. I can't wait to hear what's coming up next. Next week, our topic is um, how an agent can take advantage of the current shift in real estate. We've talked a lot about how this is the perfect storm for real estate. So we're going to dig deep into that next week. Uh, You got to make money to make money. (laughs) So Uh, That's going to be an incredible talk next week. Um, Join our Facebook group. We have Agents Thrive for Agents who want to invest, and we have Investors Thrive for those who aren't agents but still want this valuable information. And so Rick is going to walk you through every step of the way. Um, You can go to Rick Fuller Podcast for a rebroadcast, and I will also put this on Agents Thrive and Investors Thrive. So thank you so much, Rick, and I will see you next week. Everyone have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Christina. Thank you.